Chris Lee and Blake Lovell here from Southeastern 14 presented by Stakes. We are doing our preseason basketball power ratings for the SEC. Blake should be a fun and exciting season ahead. Uh, lots of teams at the top that are getting Final Four, Sweet 16 type projections. As we've said many times, the, the league is deep throughout. A lot of NIT type teams in there too. And with that, let's get started. Number 14 in our countdown, the South Carolina Gamecocks, who made an offseason coaching change, made a huge splash with a freshman signee, a junior who enrolled early. And the Gamecocks, though, don't quite have the returning experience that the other teams in the league have. Yep. As we do with our football power rankings, uh, we put together multiple sets of individual rankings here to find our composite preseason um, basketball rankings. And yeah, I just think for me, uh, I just think that South Carolina is a team that I probably have the most questions about. So for me, it made sense to put them in the spot um, just because, again, I think that you certainly have a future lottery pick to build around. Uh, and that's a great place to start. But I think there's just so many more questions with everything else and how all that comes together. So um, I just think, again, that, you know, like I said, I don't, I just don't feel like maybe they have right now the knowns that some of the other teams have in front of them and somebody's got to be put here. Right. And it just wound up being yeah. South Carolina um, for, for, yeah, just in terms of our individual rankings coming together. And this is where we had them. So, Well, and you're seeing most teams in the league in somebody's top 100, like at Ken Palm or Sagarin. So, like, all these teams have been in at least one top 100, which tells you how deep the league is when the worst team is still considered a top 100, uh, top 90 type team in a lot of cases. With that, let's get to number 13. That is the Georgia Bulldogs, a team that we think will be greatly improved. Braylon Bridges and Cario Aquindo back. Coaching change with Mike White. But Georgia was 1-17 a year ago, and so that's the mountain the Bulldogs have to climb to start leaping some of the other teams. Yeah, it's um, you're not going to make it all up in a single season. And I think that, you know, when you look at their roster, uh, I mean, there's – you know, I do think Georgia's one of those teams that could be a bit better than people think. The things that have to improve, as we know, is especially on the defensive side. I mean, they were just so bad defensively last year. New coaching staff takes over. Mike White, a very defensive-minded guy in terms of getting the most out of his teams uh, for the most part over the years on the defensive side of the floor. And so I think that's a big key to their success. And, of course, I think you've got two all-SEC all caliber players and, um, you know, Terry Oquindo and Braylon Bridges. And so I think having that to build around is a nice start. And then I think you've got some potential breakout type guys, you know, whether that's a, a Justin Hill, a Terry Roberts, a, you know, Jalen Ingram, uh, Drew Rahim, like all those guys. I mean, I, I think this this roster may be a little bit better than people will give it credit for. Um, but, you know, I think still when you compare them to the teams ahead of them, um, probably still a little work to do there for Mike White and company. Okay, we have two ties in our power rankings. This next one, or the first of our ties as we count them down. At number 11, Mississippi State and Vanderbilt tied with each other state has a coaching change with Chris Jans, brings back um, a decent number of scholarship players who played, Tula Smith, DJ Jeffries, Shaquille Moore, Cam Matthews all played a good number of minutes a year ago, and forced transfers in Jamel Horton to Sean Davis, Eric Reed Jr., and Tyler Stevenson, who all played at least 32 minutes ago. Vandy, on the other hand, loses Scotty Pippen Jr., brings back Jordan Wright, who was one of the SEC's top 10 returning players in both scoring and rebounding. Uh, Liam Robbins maybe, well, should be healthier this season. That'll help Vanderbilt a good bit. Miles Studi, who led the league in three-point shooting. If I had to make a guess with a gun to my head, I would, I would say State has a better year, but Vandy also – a little further ahead in Jerry Stackhouse's plan and, and that this is his fourth year on campus. Chris Jans has a rebuild on his hand and not a, not an awful one, but I, I guess we deferred here when state might've been the better team a year ago to just maybe have a coach is a little further on and building the program in his image, perhaps. I mean, I had Vandy ahead of Mississippi state in my individual rankings and, and I don't, you know, that, that, 
that's not a big gap there. Let's just, let me just call it like it is. Like, it's not like I'm just a hundred percent confident Vanderbilt's going to finish ahead of Mississippi state. But I think for me, it's, you know, and by the way, if you're watching this, we've done team previews for every team and we've done about probably 25 minutes for every single team in the sec. So you can go through and watch all those and get a better in-depth discussion on each individual um, team heading into the season. But I think what I mentioned in Mississippi state one was they have a lot of good talent, you know, building around Toulouse Smith. But I think really beyond that, you're banking on a lot of what ifs. And I think that's where you look at with them. I don't think they're going to be a good shooting team at all. Um, that's one area that really concerns me with them is I just wonder, you know, how, how they win games in terms of like scoring. I think yeah. they're going to have to play a lot of lower scoring games to be able to win because I just, you know, I look at it from that standpoint. I don't see a lot of great shooting jump shooting necessarily with this team. Um, and especially I think could be the case on the three point at the three point line. So that's what worries me a little bit. And I'm not saying Vanderbilt, you know, compared to them is going to be a, an excellent shooting team. But I think what we've seen, I know you can't say this for every guy, but I think Jerry Stackhouse gets the most out of his guys. And I think that from a development standpoint, I feel like they will probably be further along than people think, even in losing a guy like Scotty Pippen, it's going to look different because you're not going to have the ball in his hands, you know, on every single possession. But now, you know, a Jordan Wright stepping up, um, you know, some of the freshmen coming in and helping, whether that's Dort, whether that's Shelby, those kind of guys, Ezra Manjohn, I think will probably fit in just fine in his role. He's not going to be Scottie Pippen, but I think he'll fit in just fine into what they want to do. I think there's more upside here with Vanderbilt in terms of where they are right now, long-term, you know, I think, like I said, I think Jans is a great fit at Mississippi state and they've got a lot of intriguing talent on that roster and guys who, you know, did do things at previous stops, but I just, I don't know. I feel like Vanderbilt maybe has more of a proven chemistry right now with the group they have. Yeah. And, and that's why I would, I would lean on them just initially for me uh, heading into the season. Tell me if you agree with this and we did not discuss this ahead of time. I think this is the territory where I don't expect to see either Vanderbilt or Mississippi state in the NCAA tournament. But if you squint a little bit and say both teams win some close games, maybe pull a huge upset of a top tier team at home. I've seen crazier things happen than Vandy or state getting in the maybe the, the Dayton game to start the NCAA tournament. I'm not expecting it with either one. I, I don't think I see that at all out of South Carolina. I, I think Georgia offensively could do it, but their defense was so bad a year ago. I, I think that's a, a pretty steep rebuild. But to me, Blake, there's a little bit of a gap here, or maybe not a little bit, maybe kind of a significant gap between these two teams – and the two at the bottom, and I think this is where you can start, okay, if your fan base wants to go into the season with hopes to getting into the NCAA tournament, I think it's unlikely, but it's not crazy. No, I agree with that. I, I don't think it's it's not crazy at all to think that either of these two teams can make the tournament in best-case scenario. I think, you know, like you just said, that was a good way to put it. Their upside to me is higher than the upside of the two teams below them, and you know, that's why you rank them here, right, going into the season. So I think, no, it's it's fair to say that because, you know, we're going to talk about the teams ahead of them here in a second. And I think once you get beyond one through, we've said before, I think there's a clear one through five. You can put them in whatever order you want to put them in. But I think beyond that, you're, you're, you're playing what ifs because a lot of that, right, has to do with new coaches. And you got a lot of new coaches in different spots. And I think that's where maybe you do give Jerry Stackhouse the benefit of the doubt in that, you know, he has been here now for a couple of seasons and, yeah. you know, kind of knows the landscape of the league, kind of understands what you have to do. Um, are they recruiting as well at the top as, as some of these teams? Maybe not, but you know what? It's just still, I mean, if you're developing your guys and getting the most out of them, um, you know, I, look, I, I think that's it, right? Is, is Vanderbilt is coming off a season that they absolutely needed. <laughs> I mean, it's one they've been waiting on. Was it a perfect season? No, but they needed something like that to build some positive momentum going forward. And I think just getting that now, even if you lose your best player, I still think there's a lot of things you can build off of that. And so, yeah, I think in, in best case scenario, you know, do I think Vanderbilt's a five seed in the tournament or anything? No, but I think best case scenario, they could be one of the last, you know, eight teams into the tournament, you know, bubble team type. I think that's probably realistic. If, if again, if everything goes according to plan. Well, let's be fair, too. I mean, Vanderbilt the last 
five, six years, there's not been a team in the conference that's been hit with more significant injuries. I mean, the, the wheel of chance at some point is bound to spin and give them a healthy season sometime. And that, yeah. that's not been the case for, I don't know, six or seven. I mean, basically even going back, I think maybe into, well, certainly into Bryce Drews and maybe into Kevin Stallings' tenure. Uh, they they have and, and it's not like tenth man on the roster hurt. It's it's one of their dudes every single year. So Vandy goes into this season healthier, and, and that may be something that should factor in that, that most people wouldn't think about. So okay, staying in the state of Mississippi, the Ole Miss Rebels check in at ten. I think this is an intriguing team. Matt Morell showed signs of carrying. Ole Miss at times last year, although it generally was not good enough. Ole Miss had, what, four key players hurt, one of whom, Jarkel Joyner, is gone. Uh, but Ole Miss, another team that should benefit from better health just by chance this year, if nothing else. I think at the top, you've got Deshaun Ruffin, one of their better kids who was hurt, along with Morrell. That forms a pretty good guard combo, and then you get a lot of low- to mid-major transfers. We just don't know how good those kids are, and I think the way that question gets answered tells you whether Ole Miss slides up a couple of spots where a lot of people have the Rebels or maybe even down further than we have them pegged. Well, here are the two teams. This one and the one that's coming up next. We talked about sleeper potential. Sleeper potential, I guess you could say, is the best way to phrase to use for Vanderbilt Mississippi State. But I think these are the two teams we're about to talk about that I don't know if we're say we're underselling them, but I think these are the two teams. If you're saying have the upside, if everything goes the way the talent says it can, can crack into that top I don't want to say top tier like a Kentucky or Tennessee or Arkansas or teams like that, but can can go way higher than maybe you think. And I think Ole Miss is one of those teams because the more I look at this roster, and initially I was a little down on Ole Miss, and even though I, I still did pick them right here in this, <laughs> this spot, I still think that this is one where with Ruffin, Morrell, those guys, I mean, that's a – pretty formidable duo like we talk about in our preview which actually may come out after we release these preseason rankings so keep that in mind if you're an Ole Miss fan or a South Carolina fan uh, those two team previews may come out after we we put this out but um, I just think you, you can be really high on them I think the biggest thing I'm high on about this Ole Miss team is the defense and to me they're one of those teams that I don't think you can discount the fact that they could actually be a, a pretty good offensive team uh, but I think they're going to be a great defensive team. And I think that's something having more depth, being able to play defense the way that Kermit Davis wants his teams to play, you know, that's what they have to do because they, they've they slipped a little bit there. But I think the injuries had something to do with that last season. And you just you have to imagine that too, Chris. There's no way they can have the amount of injury issues this season as they had last yeah. season. I don't think it's just not possible. Four key guys hurt. <laughs> so, like, I just don't think that's going to happen, Um, you know, if you're playing the numbers there. So I think when you consider that, I think you've got a pretty deep rotation here, potential. Um, you know, you've got guys like McKinnis, I think, that'll come in. Yes, he's coming up from Jackson State, but I think he gives them a lot in the paint and, you know, intriguing guys like Miles Burns and, um, you know, his break field. Is he ready to take that next step to, you know, after transferring last year, for, you know, from Duke? And so I think there's there's all those questions, but I feel like this is that year that if Ole Miss is going to kind of have that breakthrough, it's going to be hard to do it, just given how strong the top of the league is. But I wouldn't be surprised at all if this is that season where they really break through and um, just stay healthy to the point to where they can have that breakthrough. Okay, this next team, a very interesting one. And in my mind, if you said which team in our countdown has the best shot to move up to or maybe more, I think, I think beyond – two might be pushing because I think we've got these teams pegged in about the right area. It might be Missouri. That's who we've got as our number nine team. Of course, Missouri gets back Kobe Brown. Uh, Missouri gets back Ronnie DeGray, who played a lot of minutes. And then you look at the kids that Dennis Gates added. DeAndre Golston, 
from Milwaukee, Isaiah Mosley at Missouri State. Both those guys played over 31 minutes a game a year ago. Scored a lot of points, averaged 35 points between them. You got Demoy Hodge and Trey Gomillion, who were guys who played almost 29 minutes a game each for Gates last year. You got Noah Carter and Nick Honor. I know you really like Honor is a point guard who's really efficient. Assist to turnover ratio nearing three. Uh, you got a couple of Juco kids, uh, one Sean East the second who could do a lot for them in the backcourt. I, I think this is a team, I look at where Missouri is being picked by most people in the media. I, I, I've seen Missouri as low as, I think, 12 and 13. I, I think that's silly. I look at the talent. I look at what Dennis Gates has done. Now, look, could be that these kids don't make a leap from being really good mid-major players to SEC. And, and that maybe that's where we're wrong. But I like this team. I would not be shocked to see Missouri slip into the big dance. No, I wouldn't either. Um, you know, again, it goes back to the discussion of we, we talk about these teams being able to outplay the expectation going into the season. I still think it's going to be hard for anyone to – dethrone the top five teams um if you know mm -hmm. barring a significant injury to one of these five teams that we'll get to in a minute but i think again there is that upside because this is the land like we just said this is the land of unknowns because you have so many new coaches i mean you've got a lot of new coaches and we've already talked about what two of or well i, I guess you're counting mike white into the mix but we've already talked about three of those teams um this will be the fourth with dennis gates we've still got two more to go. Um, so like, you know, we always say like, there's no guarantee on what you're going to get, especially in year one for a new coach coming in, trying to kind of change the foundation of what they want to do at a particular school. And we know that's what Dennis Gates is trying to do at Missouri. Um, and he does have a good nucleus to build around with Kobe Brown coming back. He's an all sec guy. Um, you know, getting, like I said, I, I am really high on a, a Nick honor just in terms of having a guy, that can play the point guard role to, to it's always for, for a successful team. You've got to have everyone with a, a pretty clearly defined oh. role, right? Everyone's got to know what their role is. Nick honors role is not to score 15 points a game. His, his role is to come in and be the most effective point guard they can have and not turn the ball over, um, be a good passer add experience, score a little bit when needed, but it's probably not going to be a put in that role where he has to score 15 a game. But I think you look around the roster, and I feel like that's where this roster comes together, is you have a lot of those guys that are going to fit certain roles. Um, and look, I, I keep saying I'm very high on Isaiah Mosley. How could you not be high on a guy that averaged 20 points a game last year? It was at Missouri State. But let's not act like Missouri State is a – The Valley's you know, a good league. <laughs> just a low major team that's you know winning 40 games a year based off of playing nobody. That's not the case. Like this was – I mean, you know, you and I know too, if you really think about it, like – we we've seen Dana Ford before and we know he mm -hmm. can get some players. And, and that was one of those where, you know, what he's done at Missouri state, he's gotten some players and, and mostly one of those guys who just can score. Now, is he going to average 20 points a game in the sec? Probably not, but I think he is that go-to type score potentially that you're going to look at and say, you give that guy the ball in those key points in a game and he will find a way to score. And so all those things, you know, and we not we haven't even gone through the whole roster. We do that in our Missouri preview. Find that on the channel. Um, but like, the, there's a lot of stuff here that I think, knowing the style they're going to play, you know, sort of that aggressive, you know, type of defense where they're going to force turnovers. They're going to try to get a lot of easy baskets on the other side, you know, at the rim, um, needing to shoot the ball a bit better. I think that's something that will stand out with this team. Uh, you know, and they've got a lot of good pieces. And I think it's, as we said, always, there's never a guarantee when you've got a new coach coming in, but I, you guys know I'm high on Dennis Gates. I'm really high on the roster he's put together here in year one. I think it's just, again, you're banking on a lot of these guys coming up, um, to be able to, to match that sec, you know, caliber roster that you're seeing in other places. And I think he's done a pretty good job putting one together that that could get close to, to doing that. So. Yeah, and I would encourage people, if, if you want a more deeper dive, that's horrible English, if you'd like a deeper dive on Missouri, check out our preview there. Um, if I turn Blake loose on Dennis Gates, then the power rankings would go an extra hour. But we did opine about that there. Um, 
we always kid that Blake is Dennis Gates' his agent. But you talked about the unknown. Uh, I mean, Dennis Gates has got an incredible history of, of taking the unknown coming yeah. into a season and making it work. But uh, we won't belabor the point here. Okay, number eight in our countdown, a team that I think you've seen maybe a spot higher in some other places, and, and maybe those folks are right and we're not. LSU, which, man, talk about Dennis Gates-style situations. Matt McMahon took that job at one point at zero players on the roster, got a few back, added a couple of his kids from Murray State, and the Tigers, a team that, again, a lot crazier things could happen than for LSU to make the NCAA tournament in year one under Matt McMahon. There's a very good chance we're looking back on this in March and realizing well, how do we undersell LSU this much? Because, you know, but but it is it's the same situation. It's where there's a lot of, you know, new guys coming in. But I think the the combination of having guys that achieve what they achieved at Murray State, and like we said, this is not just a, you know, your typical OVC. They were 31 and three. They they won a lot of games. They played good competition, um, you know, in terms of getting to the tournament, like that kind of stuff. So, like, I think you have to give a little bit of that. I think the reason why maybe – look, to me, these next three teams, you know, and, and you guys probably know who the next couple are going to be. You may not know the order. LSU, Florida, a and I I think all three of these teams, to me, are – put them in whatever order you want to put them in. I'm not going to argue with you, really, to, to be honest. Like, I'm, I'm not going to have a hard argument any way you slice it with these three teams. Um, because I just think that, look, if they, I mean, it's just by based by based on the order, one of these three teams is the one that has the best chance, right. To crack into that top five, because they're, this is where we have them. So like, they're the closest to that group. So I think LSU could absolutely be one of those teams because KJ Williams, I have no hesitation that he'll be just fine. <laughs> I don't know if he'll, you know, average 18 points a game and eight rebounds, but he'll have a chance because I, I think he's, he's that good. Um, and you know, I think he'll come in and help them obviously right away. To me, the biggest thing with LSU is they're going to have great guard play. I think it's how does everything develop in the front court specifically? I, you know, I I, I want to see like what what kind of production does Kendall Coleman give them coming in yeah. from Northwestern State? You know, average the numbers. He did 17 double doubles last year. Um, I think a guy that that will, I think, translate. Now, again, does he translate to the level of production? I, I can't tell you that. But they've also got those guys like, you know, I mean, a Derek Fountain, um, you know, some of the freshman guys, I think that'll play right away. Good size in that freshman group we talked about with Jalen Reed and Sean Phillips. Um, but I think the bigger question for me, well, there's two of them. Moani Wilkinson, you know, can he be, you know, the role will expand for him. What does that look like? He started a lot of games. And then Adam Miller. Um, if Adam Miller can be the Adam Miller we think he can be, I think LSU will absolutely finish higher than eighth. Um, and, you know, again, this is, it's just always kind of interesting to look at these teams, but I, I think we're probably looking back at this and saying LSU at eight was probably too low, just based on they do have some guys that won some games, and um, yeah. it's just again you got to put these teams somewhere. So LSU, Florida A and M, put them in any order you want. I'm not gonna really disagree with it. So okay, a quick word for my presenting sponsors stakes that's s t a k e s predict sports better than the crowd for a chance to earn nfts with stakes players can submit their sports predictions against friends, other fans, and influencers forever. Don't let your sports genius go overlooked. Join stakes and have the best predictions captured in the moment. Go to playwithstakes.com forward slash 14 use our invite code southeastern 14 and get a double welcome bonus free to join free to play you can win stuff you can brag when you beat us have some fun with it it's, it's a great app we love it just go in and join it and uh, help out those who help our show okay now we get to the top half of our rankings, and this was territory where we had a lot of trouble sorting through things, so we just threw up our hands and said, Florida and A&M, you're, you're tied here. And I, <laughs> basically. I don't I mean, know really what the right call it. is. No. Yeah. I, again, with these three teams, to me, it's basically throwing up your hands. Um, I mean, really, I, I don't know what order to put these in. I, I know, again, they're – 
probably be some LSU fans that think we're we have them too low, and that's fine. Maybe A and M fans think we have them too low. Florida fans think we have them too low. I just I don't know where to put these three teams. Just being completely honest with you, and you know, you can say it's it's our job to know that. <laughs> not going into the season, it's not because <laughs> who knows, man. I mean, this is again, this is where this league is so different this year. Because again, you have to remember how many new coaches there are. And I think mm-hmm. that makes it so hard to predict what is going to happen. You can look at what guys did elsewhere and, and have all the, you know, you can have the the Dennis Gates love that I have. But like, again, there's no guarantees on anything um, because it, it is one where Todd Golden's going to take over, you know, at Florida. And clearly, you guys know, we have A&M at seven, Florida at six. What's the separator there for me? Well, for me, it's like, it's Colin Castleton. Well, it's Castleton and it's AM losing. They're Colin Castleton, right? And Quentin Jackson. Yep. Um, so I think that's kind of the difference. And and I think Castleton is what probably you're gonna give the nod just because they have a guy like that. And but Chris, I'm I say this, like we we may have them, you know, right here tied in this range or whatever, but it's you know, I Colin Castleton supporting cast, there's a lot to be determined on what that looks like for Florida and, and who those guys are that step up and, you know, are able to help them on offense because there's a lot of intriguing offensive players, but we talked about that team last year. They were not great offensively. And um, obviously, you know, Todd Golden and staff are going to take a very analytical approach to things. And, you know, they'll have the the best group on the floor from an efficiency standpoint that they can find. Um, And I'm just, I don't know. Like like I'm, I still am unsure what to expect with Florida, Uh, but I think having Castleton, is that separator from a lot of other teams? Because if you ask me right now, I think Colin Castleton is, you know, the second best player in the SEC behind Oscar Sheepway. And I don't think that's, you know, going out on a limb that much. Um, I just think he's clearly that guy. So if you put that in perspective, I think that's what gives me, you know, a little bit of a boost to put Florida maybe ahead of AM. But at the same time, AM's got four returning starters. Um, I think this will be a great, de- maybe the best defensive team in the SEC, perhaps. Um, you know, I don't want to knock Tennessee though. I think Tennessee will be right there. And so will the teams near the top, but I think this is going to be a team that will challenge for being one of the better defensive teams in the league. Um, they finished in the top 30 in turnover percentage every year under Buzz Williams. So they're going to force some turnovers, but what you're banking on with A&M is the breakouts offensively of a lot of different guys, you know, not just one guy, Chris, a lot of guys are going to have to break out offensively. I think for them and Manny Obasecki, I think is at the top of that list. Um, I think Tyrese Radford will be that guy that breaks out. Um, but I mean, depth wise, A and M's got as much depth as anybody. And I mean, really, when you look yeah. at the roster, like they do have as much depth as probably anybody in the league. Uh, but you know, are all those guys going to pan out? We don't know. So yeah, like you said, throw your hands up for this one. Give us your best argument on how do you separate these three teams going to the season? But um, I don't really, I, th- I don't think there's much of a gap between Florida and M and LSU. Well, I want, I want to dig in a little bit on both teams here. And again, we have previewed all the teams, and you can go here 25, 35, sometimes 45 minutes on your team. Uh, a lot of that depending on how much time we mm. had the day we recorded yeah. these. But, okay, Florida, other than Castleton, people may not nay, know the name Kyle Lofton. Kyle Lofton averaged 38 and a half minutes at St. Bonaventure a year ago. Uh, during that time – he averaged 2.3 assists to turnover, shot 82% from the foul line. <laughs> Those are really good things to have in your point guard. Durability, take care of the ball, hit your free throws. From there, a, a lot of wild cards. And I know you like some lower guys on this roster. Kawasi Reeves would be one that you spend a lot of time talking about. They've got several guys, several bigs who played a lot of minutes for them in that 10 to 15 minute range a year ago who are back. Uh, so there's maybe some underrated depth there that people would overlook. Uh, Will Richard, I want to see how his production translates or does not translate from Belmont. Uh, we are in the Nashville area, so we are familiar with Will Richard. And then I think one of the biggest two or three wild cards in the league in Myron Jones, who at times can get you 20, 22 points, win you a game with some timely shooting, Last year, that just didn't happen. Richard's numbers, or excuse me, Jones's numbers fell off a cliff from what he had done at Penn State. He averaged, let's see, eight and a half points, shot 36% from the field. Um, 
28 minutes. Like if he becomes the 15 point a game scorer that he was at Penn State and shoots it more efficiently, he was a almost a 40 percent three point shooter there. Then this is the team that that maybe even cracks the top five. I wouldn't predict it, but in, under that scenario, it's not the craziest thing that's happened. No, I agree. Um, and that's like, I mean, I've keep saying like someone, no one can crack into the top five, but sure they can. I mean, I think it's I'm not, tough, I'm not, but well, I'm not saying right. Alabama's going to be what Alabama was last year, right? But I mean, we we didn't think there was a chance Alabama could fall out of the last five, you know, top five last year, and look what happened. So I mean, it's we we know every year it seems like, and it, maybe it's not every single season, but there are some of those teams that are going to shoot up the standings way higher than you think they are, um, and we've seen that before. So it, it wouldn't be surprised me to see any of these teams in this range. Like we said, I wouldn't surprise me to see Florida do it. Wouldn't surprise me to see. Um, LSU do it, um, you know, like I said, even an Ole Miss maybe. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of um, potential things that could happen in this range. Yeah, I think Florida and A&M are two of the teams that I've had the hardest time with. With A&M, you just look across the roster and you see some high-scoring guards in this league. Manny Obieski can be that for him, them potentially, uh, but – Last year, that was 3.6 points a game. They only played 13 minutes, played more at the end of the year. Point is, it's not proven. Their best returning player, I think, by most people, would be Henry Coleman the second, who transferred from Duke and averaged 11 and 6, although not, not a big shot blocker underneath. You'd like to see him assert himself a little bit more in that regard. And, and then it's a lot of guys, Blake. Uh, you said they're going to defend. Uh, Dexter Dennis, who transferred from Wichita State, could be at the top of the list of their defenders. Uh, they get Tyrese Radford back, who was kind of an underrated player, quietly averaged 11 points a game, shot 49% from the field and 30% from three. But, you, know, you got Andre Gordon, Wade Taylor, Anderson Garcia transferring in from Mississippi State. You just got a lot of guys, and I'm, I'm just not as sure. I'm not saying it can't happen. But I feel like you look at the teams ahead of them and even some of them behind them, and there's a little bit more scoring certainty in the, the backcourt than there is here. Because I, I think, as you pointed out, um, Quentin Jackson was a big loss. Quentin Jackson at times could really carry you as a score. And I, I think, like, you bring Quentin Jackson back, this might be a top 10 team in the country. Uh, but that was a loss where I, I don't think AM really needed it. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we got about 40 minutes of AM talk in our other video. So if you want to go hear us dissect what they could be, um, it's in there. But yeah, I mean, I I don't have a lot more to add other than I just don't know what to do with these three teams, specifically Florida, AM, and LSU. So okay. Next we get to the state of Alabama. I think we had a hard time distinguishing between who's better. So one fan base is going to love us. The other is going to hate us. We picked Alabama five and Auburn four. I, I probably didn't have as hard a time as you would think. Um, and I know Alabama fans, we like to joke sometimes that I'm, I'm a big Auburn guy, but um, Alabama fans do that in fun. Uh, but I mean, I, well, I last let, year, let me, let me, I, I think I'm going to speak for you. I, I think it's provenness and cohesiveness at guard. Auburn's backcourt lost at some games, but those kids always play hard. They're back. Alabama's going to have good guard play. The problem is, or the challenge maybe, is that some of those guys were just playing elsewhere a year ago, whereas Bruce Pearl's guys were not. Yeah, I think that's probably a portion of it. But you also, I think you also need Bruce Pearl's guys to be a little bit better too in terms of efficiency. Um, you know, I think especially on the offensive end, um, you know, and that'll, that'll come down to KJ Johnson and, and those kind of guys, I think, continuing to improve their offensive games. Uh, we talked about, you know, just by necessity, what that Auburn team was built around last year, it was built around the top two guys that were going to go be lottery picks in the NBA. And I think, you know, replacing, expecting Traore and Broom to come in and just do the exact same things. I think it's probably a little unfair not to say that they can't, because they are going to be, I think, really good players. And um, they will clearly be two guys playing at 6'10 apiece. But you can now plug in two more big guys into your front court and, and give yourself an advantage just from a size standpoint. Um, but they're going to be they're going to be really good. But I think the thing is, like, the depth at guard 
there is something to that. I mean, you know, Zepp Jasper just was tremendous. We talked about just the, the I mean, the guy just t- didn't turn the ball over, um, played a lot yeah. of minutes, and just didn't turn it over. And that was so important. Um, and then, of course, you know, KJ Johnson, I think he's, he's still put up points, uh, just more consistency, I think, is what you want to see and the shot selection and those kind of things. I think that will be a big part of this guard group this year. But but those are the kind of things you expect to get better. And if it does get better, Auburn can win the SEC. Um, you know, those are just things you're banking on. But the one the one thing with Auburn, and we're just going to say this quickly because we've already gone into this for 35 plus minutes elsewhere. It's Alan Flanagan. It's just, you know, if Alan yeah. Flanagan can be Alan Flanagan and the injuries aren't causing the issues that clearly they, they were causing last year, he's the difference to me. He's the difference that moves them from number four to competing for number one. And I think that's, you know, that's the, the thing for me that separates a lot of that. Um, so that's why I probably put Auburn. You just kind of, you know, they're going to be able to force turnovers. Um, can they shoot the ball better? Because that's something they've struggled in in recent seasons. I think it's just that's it. What what does the rotation look like in the front court? I think your back court's set. And beyond that, I think that's what you feel about Auburn. On Alabama's front, I have really high expectations for Mark Sears, Dominic Welch, the Mari Burnett. Um, you know, once Quinterly comes back, think about that, what what that does for them. I think Alabama could certainly make the argument that they're the deepest team in the league. But you know, again, I think that there may still be some things that they want to try to work out, um, you know, in terms of shot selection, too, I think will be a big part of it. Uh, defensively, I think you've got a lot of guys who can, will be able to defend. Obviously, the addition of Brandon Miller really helps them out, um, given his length and just ability to play anywhere on the floor. And then Mark Sears, you know, I think he's going to be really good. So a lot of things I like about Alabama. You could put these two. In any order, I just initially went with Auburn here, um, which I know some people will have some fun with because we, we have that running joke throughout the years um, between my my Alabama and Auburn following. Um, love you guys all. But uh, initially, I'm going to give the nod to Auburn here, I think, uh, to start the season. Just um, may, maybe some of the knowns versus, I don't know. I think last year, and it's not fair maybe to do that, but you know, I think last year kind of. They looked bad at times a year ago. Yeah, Alabama just, uh, you know, it did not, it was a little, I don't know what the words I'm searching for, but it was a little shocking at times, I think, for just how much things went in the the opposite direction. Well, yeah, it's just, yeah, I think the inconsistency was clear. So um, I think you want to see that a little bit more with this team. And, um, you know, you're plugging in new new pieces basically at every position um, outside of, you know, a couple different, a couple guys, but, um, yeah. So, you know, is that, is there, is there a huge difference between Alabama and Auburn? You know, if I did my national rankings, I don't know what I'd have probably Auburn a spot or two ahead of Alabama. So it's not like there'd be a huge difference. Yeah. A couple of interesting things on Alabama, Dominic Welch, who transferred from St. Bonaventure played 37 and a half minutes a game. Mark Sears from Ohio played 36. Both those guys averaged six boards a game. Not often you see, Guards average six rebounds a game. Alabama's got two of them. Um, although Welch is a is a bigger guard. He's 6'5". Charles Bediaco, not a guy we've talked a lot about, but was a very highly regarded freshman, uh, can block a lot of shots, was a bit player for them a year ago, averaged about 18 minutes a game, blocked a shot and a half a game. Of course, they bring in Brandon Miller. So uh, just some interesting things. Uh, maybe that'll help Alabama get some defensive stops through blocks and and some boards from some places you don't expect them that the tide couldn't get a year ago. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I, yeah, I think it's just talent wise, Alabama's good enough to win the league talent wise. Um, same with Auburn, but at least right now, I think there are three teams better than they are, and we'll see if that that turns out to be be the case. So. Okay, our, our top three, and I think all these are getting some top five in the country love at particular places. Number three, we have Arkansas. Arkansas could be the last team standing of all these teams the last in two March. Seasons. <laughs> yeah, well, that, uh, but a lot more experience at the other two schools, and I think that was a separator. Look, I mean, Arkansas could be – and you saw this with Eric Musselman's team a year ago, Blake. 
lost the first three, then I think ran the table or did they run the in table the or did they lose one in the SEC? Right. In, in league play, they start 0 3. We're going, and this isn't even a tournament team. And, and they get to the Elite Eight and, and knock off the number one seed in the whole tournament. Um, I think from memory, Arkansas probably had more returning a year ago than it does this year. You tell me. If you well, yeah, I mean, it definitely that, uh... it had. Well, it, it look, look, let's, I think this is our answer. Two guys coming back, Devontae Davis, Kamani Johnson. Johnson averaged eight minutes a game a year ago. So there, there's your answer. I, what I'm getting at, I, I think this is a team that, like, best class of incoming kids in the league, maybe for both transfers and freshmen. But it can take a while for that to gel, and you could see Arkansas struggle a little bit earlier and then be the best team in the league by the time this season's over. Yeah, I mean, you just repeated everything I said in our Arkansas team preview. Like, don't be surprised at all. Even if this team gets out to another 8 or 9 and 0 star, whatever it was last year, don't be surprised if they lose some games and don't look like a Final Four team early. Because it's just we it's what we've seen before. And, like, there's no reason to panic. It's just, you you know the must bus, gonna going to pull over, going to load up on snacks, grab a few corn nuts, grab a nice zero bar, gas up the tank, and probably have a chance to get to the Elite Eight because that's what we've seen the past two seasons. Um, so, like, what is it, Chris? I mean, the last two years they've had, let's see, 21 season. They lost four or five to start January. Last season, they lost four or five from about, or no, five of six from about mid-December to mid-January. And then guess what happens? The, the must bus, bus flattened everybody else. It took the, the curves at 90 miles an hour. Yeah. And didn't tip over. So that's the deal is, you know, are there going to be some people that completely overreact to some early season results every year, no matter who the team is? Sure. Will Arkansas be one of those teams? Maybe. But I just, I, I give Eric, Eric Musselman the benefit of the doubt that he will figure it out because he's got a new team here again. Like it's just a lot of new faces, a lot of talent with those new faces, but will it all come together just as smooth as can be in week one? Nope. I can guarantee you that. Even if they beat whoever by 50, there's still a lot of stuff they'll have to correct going into SEC play. It's just the way it works. Yeah. And so um, I think especially when you're leaning on freshmen, and there are some freshmen that they will be leaning on, of course. So as good as Nick Smith is, as good as Anthony Black is, and all those guys, there will still be a slight adjustment, even if they're putting up big numbers. Um, and so I think that's it. That's what you have to keep in mind. So us picking Arkansas at three, Went back and forth on where to put the hogs. Um, you know, and again, it goes it goes down to your ranking. What 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 is a preseason ranking? Is it what you think a team is now or what you think a team will be? I don't dissect it however you want to dissect it. I'm just telling you I would put them at three right now, too, because I think that the two teams ahead of them, I think will probably be in a better spot. Um just with the knowns. Uh there are unknowns yeah. with Arkansas because it's a new team. I mean, there's a lot of new players. So uh, you know, I think that's something to certainly keep in mind. Yes, I know they've got guys coming back, but you know, this is you're we're plugging in a a new group and a lot of a lot of spots and a lot of roles that are going to have to be filled. Uh, and you feel comfortable about where they're at. So, yeah, I mean, Arkansas can win the league. There's no question about it. Arkansas is a top ten team in my opinion. But guess what, <laughs> Chris? They just they just happen to be behind two other teams that I think are top ten teams as well. So, not a knock on well, Arkansas by any means. We had a lot of trouble separating Kentucky and Tennessee at the top. Ultimately, we went with Kentucky, I think, for a couple reasons. Uh, if you go back and you take these standings from the last five years, the last 10 years, the last 15 years, the last 20 years, and you do a composite standings, like who's the team that is on top of every one of those? I mean, it's probably Kentucky is my guess. It is Kentucky. <laughs> and and even though this has been a downtime for John Calipari and the rest of the league has gotten better, point is – even in a downtime, Kentucky has stayed at the top. You have things at Kentucky that you basically never have. Uh, you almost never have a returning point guard. Kentucky gets that in Savio Wheeler, who also missed some time with injury last year. Kentucky never gets back a reigning national player of the year. It gets that back in Oscar Shibwe. I, I think the combination of experience at the point and – the national player of the year. That's that's 
really hard to bet against. Uh, you look at supporting parts. You got Jacob Toppin, who's got a 46 inch vertical leap, and some people are taking as a breakout player. He's in there. Damian Collins, Lance Ware both have played some minutes in Lexington. You got CJ Frederick, who would have helped them a year ago, uh, was supposedly the best shooter on their team a year ago. Didn't play a minute because he was hurt. He's an Iowa transfer. Uh, you've got Antonio Reeves from Illinois State, averaged 20 points a game. You got uh, two, three terrific freshman recruits, uh, two in particular in Wallace and Livingston, who were all ranked in the top 15, maybe top 10. Um, anyway, that that's my take on Kentucky. We'll get into Tennessee, but I'll give you a minute to respond. Well, I'll just group them together because let me just tell you, like you said, we have done previews on both teams. You can check those out. Went pretty deep into both of them. Um, I think Kentucky and Tennessee are good enough to win it all. Not the SEC, uh, the national championship. I think both teams are good enough. And full disclosure, when I sent Chris my initial list, I had Tennessee at the top. Um, I decided to change that, and I think it's the reason you just mentioned. It's just like if if Oscar Shibway does not come back and you give me the same Kentucky team with another guy that averaged double figures somewhere and you're like, he'll, he'll translate. I'd probably pick Tennessee. But the fact is yeah. that he's coming back and you're adding all the pieces around him that you're adding. I just it's hard to ignore the fact that the reigning unanimous keep that in mind unanimous player of the year is returning and is he going to put the, up the exact same numbers the likelihood of that Chris I think is probably not great in terms of you know those kind of numbers but he's still going to put up big numbers like I mean let's not kid ourselves here um, barring an injury he's still going to be uh, he's going to have a chance to win the player of the year again he's the favorite to do it um, will it be unanimous I don't know about that but. The guy is was fantastic last year. Just one of the better seasons we've seen in a while. Um, I think just having that makes me, you know, and, and like I said, I, we just made the argument a minute ago. I think Arkansas, Tennessee, and Kentucky are all top 10 teams. Um, I think Tennessee and Kentucky are both top five teams, in my opinion. So I think when you consider that, that gap is very, very tiny um, between where they're at. But I think with Kentucky, you know, the thing is, you just, you look at Shibway, You've got two freshmen coming in with Wallace and Livingston that will certainly be right there right away with a chance to make huge, you know, contributions. I think the carving of the roles that we always talk about are a little bit more defined with this team because you do have CJ Frederick, who's going to really be able to help them on the perimeter side, shooting the ball. Antonio Reeves will as well. Um, you've got breakout candidates all across the board, whether that's a, you know, a Jacob Toppin, um, Damian Collins, uh, all those type of guys, right? So I think you kind of look at that and, and feel like these guys are going to really give them, you know, a boost as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, you're splitting hairs here, in my opinion, between these two teams, but I think they're both top five good. And I think the difference just is that Oscar Sheepway is coming back for Kentucky, and I, I don't think you can ignore the impact that can have on that team. And I know what everyone's going to say, right? Oh, well, they lost to St. Peter's, and it's a new season. Um, I get it, but – like, you know, it's a new season. We have to move on and just start talking about it from this point forward. And um, I just think them being able to use their size and length and, um, you know, just the defensive team, I think they'll block a lot more shots. We talked about that in the, the team preview. All those things combined. Um, Kentucky, by the slightest edge, I will give them. But I I do really think Tennessee is good enough to win the whole thing. I really do. Like, I, I think that I, I have grown more – excited by the prospect of Tennessee by the day. Uh, and you know what? If you ask me this on Monday and I'm like, hey, can we do redo our rankings? I may put Tennessee at number one because it's just, I, I think that, they, and that's not just going off of the Gonzaga result, by the way. I know a lot of people will talk about them just beating down the Zags in that exhibition game. Um, but I think there's, I think these two teams are about as close together as it gets because I, I do think they're both top five. You know, one thing we did not cover with the Vols in our Tennessee preview was Tyreek Key. And we talk a lot about, okay, this guy did this. At a, well, no, but I'm, I'm saying there's another piece here that we didn't get into. Because no. we always say transfers are unknowns, right? And, and look, this, is, this doesn't – a one-game sample size does not overturn the whole apple cart here. But Tyreek Key last year – Played more minutes per game than anybody on this roster. That was at Indiana State where he played 34. Averaged more points per game at 17.3 than anybody on this roster. 
5.3 boards. That would have made him Tennessee's, what, third leading rebounder behind Josiah Jordan James and Olivia Kumwa, who got hurt. That was, we talk about teams missing pieces. Uh, that's one that left a mark for Tennessee when he went down late. More assists than turnovers, averaged over a steal per game, shot 47% from the field, 84% from the line. We're like, well, you know, is he just a piece on this team or is he a, a big cog and he scores 26 against Gonzaga in that exhibition game, which in my mind uh, make, makes Tennessee a little bit scarier now that we know that. Yeah, he'll be a big addition. And I mean, to me, they've got three, not saying they're all going to make it, guys, but they got three first team all SEC guys in their starting lineup, um, as probably a couple other teams do. I think Ziegler, Vescovy, James, they're all first team guys. Um, you know, uh, we talked about to mention Ziegler. whatever Julian Phillips becomes. Right. I mean, he's, he's an all freshman yeah. without question. Um, so. Yeah, I think those are the kind of things you look at. I think Kamwa coming back, that's a huge boost to them. So, yeah, I mean, look, it's Kentucky fans will say what they will. You know, Tennessee fans will say what they will, but Arkansas fans, same way. But, like, guess what? You all got great teams. And I think it's the same for Auburn and Alabama. I think those are top 20 teams. So, you cannot, these top five are really strong. And, um, like I said, whatever order they finish in, would not be shocked because I think that, um, yeah, got a lot of a lot of fun possibilities here. All right, Chris, we're going to wrap it up here quickly in a second, but I'm going to give you one one mulligan, okay? I'm going to ask you this question real quick. If you had to change, if you're right now, if you had to make one change in this and the one maybe you would, you know, look back and say, I think that's where I should have put this team higher, lower, swapped this team with that team, who would it be? I got mine. I want to know what yours would be. You don't have to pick one. I, Just, I, well... If you're confident in your order, that's fine. But like I, I, I well, you confident. you should never never be confident in anything. Uh, none of us get it all right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, maybe if if you want to go the conservative one, it is flipping Tennessee and Kentucky. If you want to go, pick your surprise and go a little riskier. Um, I would have moved Missouri up a couple of spots. Now, that one may completely bomb, but there's always somebody who surprises. Those would be probably my two. I think I would swap LSU and A&M because I think, and maybe LSU with Florida and A&M too, because I, I, I talked myself into them a minute ago with them. I think that, I don't know, I just, I, there's something about this LSU team I really like. Um but, you know, I, I don't, I still don't, you know, but I think a lot of that's Adam Miller to me. It's like if, if, if yeah. Adam Miller is really Adam Miller and he's coming off that injury and he can add that three point shooting element, like I think that just gives them such a huge boost on this roster. So um, maybe that's one. Cause I think AM, I'm just, I want to see it on the offensive side. Defensive side have yeah. zero, zero concerns. Offensive side, I want to see what they look like without Quentin Jackson. And that's probably my biggest question. So there you go. Well, for full disclosure, uh, we we didn't we didn't share our rankings ahead of time. Although I had a pretty, I think we both had a pretty good idea where we were going to rank other teams based on conversations. But I think when we had private conversations off podcast, I think we both struggled to a degree with what to do with Florida and A and M because there are. Pretty significant risk with both teams, and I think especially with AM that are not necessarily getting run in the mainstream discussion. I mean, we've seen AM as high as number two overall in Lindy's. I thought that was crazy. Um, no disrespect to the Aggies or Buzz Williams, and sometimes it's playing that grinding defense does not put numbers on paper for us to analyze. And I like things that I can quantify, maybe to a fault. But point being, a and I mean, you look at the backcourt scoring in this league, and a and on paper does not really match up with some of the other teams. Now, again, the Aggies will probably make up for that in other ways, but those were two teams where I had trouble because if you said, hey, but both teams slide down a couple of spots to a couple of teams we had behind them, it's probably not where you pick. 
because of what's proven and what's returning. And I think you always kind of lean on what you know as a foundation. But, yeah, there were things with both teams that I found problematic, and especially with Florida, if Myron Jones can't get his shooting form back. Let's tip it off. Let's tip it off. And when we do tip it off, my goodness, we will have have you covered wall to wall. We're going to have our player rankings coming up on our channel. We will do previews like we did last year. I think we're going to preview every single game involving SEC teams. We're also going to preview some of the key games around the non-conference slate, Thanksgiving tournaments, maybe opening night. Now, we're probably not going to preview every game all the time. And a big reason for that is we are in the middle of football season. So um, if Florida and St. Francis are playing, I don't even think they play, but just as an example, you, you, may, you may not see that on our channel. Anything of consequence, though, you probably will. We are previewing every single game for the football season, and we'll continue to preview those involving SEC teams. Um, baseball, when that gets here, we will get you wall-to-wall in baseball, too. But point is, if you have not subscribed and you want to get that stuff, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of it. Thanks to Blake for joining me today. Thanks to our partners at Stakes. Be sure to go in and get that app and have some fun there. Thanks for watching us at Southeastern 14, and we'll see you again very soon.